and techniques uh, allow uh, for the research uh, in these new ways. Her research interests include historical linguistics, contact linguistics, topology, mapping, simulation, virtual reality, and data, data visualizations. Uh, she's a member of the Marx Institute uh, for Brain Behavior and Development, the Center for Excellence for Language Dynamics, and the Center for Excellence of Australian Biodiversity and Heritage. She co-leads the uh, Intergenerate Living Lab at Western Sydney University, and she is the treasurer for the Australian, uh, sorry, Australasian Association uh, of Digital Humanities and the New South Wales coordinator for the Australian Computational and Linguistics Olympia. Um, current Australian Research Council projects include how it how it envisions our uh, archive insights into Australian Aboriginal language, kinship and culture, mapping print, charting and enlightenment, uh, waves of words, mapping and uh, modeling the history of Australia's uh, Asia Pacific ties and seeing yourself in digital cultural heritage. So that's, that's quite a mouthful. And I actually realized I completely forgot to turn on the recording. I'll do that now and then I'll, I'll shut up and I'll uh, let Rachel do the, do the word from here. Um, okay, so I need to share my screen. Hopefully this isn't the part where you discover that I don't actually know how to do digital things. Let me see if I can. Well, otherwise, just blame it on me and I'll <laughs> need to do something. <laughs> and what I also I see that the DNA already share. turned on the recording. All right. I think if I share my browser, that will give us everything that you need. Oh, I can um, already see your I browser. I actually want to start here, not there. And make it start. Present. Okay, can you see my slides? Yeah, I can, but I also see two Zoom windows still over it. Yep, uh, now, now everything looks fine. Perfect. <laughs> that was awkward. Also surprising because I told it to only share my um, Chrome. Never mind. So thank you very much for inviting me. And before I get started, can I just confirm how long I should talk for and how long I should leave for questions? Okay, well, I think that's kind of up to you as well. So we do want to stop at 11. So that's in about uh, 52 minutes uh, yeah. from now. So I might try to leave maybe 15, 10 to 15 minutes at the end for questions. Yeah, I think that would be, that should be fine. Okay, good. So yes, thank you very much for inviting me. I um, see some, well, names and a few faces that I remember from visiting uh, Sadala several years ago now, which is one of the highlights of my travels, I think, um, visiting both the beautiful country of South Africa and also the amazing researches and projects that you have happening in Sadala. So it's a real privilege to be able to talk to you again and also make some connections with new people who I didn't meet at that time. Um, and the project that I want to talk to you about was one that at the time when I visited, we were just starting. And I might have mentioned it to a few people maybe, but we obviously didn't have any results at that point. And now the project has just finished. So officially we finished at the end of last year. Um, so a couple of months ago, but all of you as researchers know that a project never really quite finishes. And so there's some exciting kind of loose ends that we hope to keep working on as time passes, even though the funding is now ended. So I'll start by giving you a little bit of background um, and then talk about the different kinds of digital humanities aspects of the project. It's quite a large collaborative project with people from all kinds of disciplines many of whom have don't do any digital work. And so not all of the project was organized around things that are relevant to digital humanities, but quite a lot of it was. So I'll talk about a few of those different aspects and some of the challenges that we've faced and tried to overcome. And I hope that some of it might have lessons that are relevant to some of your projects, or at least that might help you think about um, projects you might imagine in the future. So to start with, um, this project was looking at archives that exist in various libraries and museums in Australia. Um, the archives contain tens of thousands of documents 
that were written by, collected by, created by correspondence with particularly two men, um, A.W. Howitt and Lorimer Fison. And they were, I guess, pioneering anthropologists in Australia in the late 19th century. They were in Victoria, and I'm just, for those of you who aren't so familiar with Australia, going to skip through to Google Maps. Well, wow, that's really unfortunate. That's not what Australia looks like. Can you see Google Maps? Or did that, I mean, obviously it's not working, but changing my browser window actually shows you a map. Yes. Yeah, we can see the okay. map now. You can see the map, okay. Oh, goodness me. Apparently Google really doesn't like Australia today. Right, so <laughs> the main region that they focused on where they were based was Victoria, which is the state down in the bottom right. Um, one of the smaller states of Australia. So they were based out of Melbourne. Um, and so a lot of the materials that they collected related to languages and people from this region. However, they also had extensive correspondence with people around Australia and even into the Pacific. And they were collecting all kinds of linguistic information particularly, but also cultural information um, about some of their specific anthropological interests, particularly things like kinship systems. They were collecting these from people all around Australia, all around Australia and the Pacific. Uh, did something just stop working? Uh, yeah, we lost your, your screen lost share. my screen? Yeah, it just cancelled for some reason. Let me put that back in. Uh, okay, I think that's working again. Um, yeah, so they, they, they did in the archives, I'd say about maybe 60 to 70% of the material relates to things from the state of Victoria or what's now the state of Victoria. Obviously, these boundaries have no significance at that time really. Um, and certainly had absolutely no significance to the Aboriginal people that they were working with, uh, their colonial fiction that's been imposed on the map since then. Um, but from that region approximately, and then the rest of the materials related to wider areas of Australia right across to what's now Western Australia. So I'll go back to my slides now. Stop, oops, stop letting Google Maps mess everything up. Right, so Howard and Fison um, were the correspondents and the authors of many of these documents, but one of the main people who, whose voice is actually in the documents and whose ideas and knowledge is represented there was actually Tuliba, the man on the left in this photograph. And his collaboration with Howard and Fison is what makes this archive important and significant and interesting. Uh, without him, it would never have existed. And even to the extent of a lot of the analysis, the linguistic analysis, the cultural analysis, and the ways of interpreting the data, a lot of it um, seems to have been Tuliba's ideas, where we see Howard and Fison giving other people credit for things like the type of diagrams they draw, it always comes back to Tuliba. So his significance can't be overstated. Unfortunately, with colonial archives being the way they are, so little has been kept of information about him compared to the information about Howard and Fison. We have extensive biographies of these two men, but very little about Tuliba, which is unfortunate. Um, so the materials, in that should be 70,000. I'm missing a zero. The materials in the archives include 70,000 pages of correspondence, field notes, um, circulars, nine boxes of correspondence. Actually, we found a lot more than that in the end. This was the initial cataloging of the data we did, but things turn up right through a project, of course. Images, postcards, letters, um, and there was also some materials overseas in Rochester University for some reason, collected by his, one of his correspondents there and some materials in smaller private libraries. So there was a lot of 
a lot of items to bring together and to start to think about. And one of the reasons no one had done this before is that all of, well, almost all of these institutions were aware of the huge cultural significance of these items. In many cases, they contained the only documentation of some languages of the region. They contain di diagrams and drawings of significant cultural sites. They contained information about sensitive cultural practices like initiation ceremonies. They contain songs, um, very, very important and sen potentially sensitive information. And so the institutions that hold them knew that they, they couldn't just make these public and put them on a website with no context. And they needed to do extensive consultation with the communities who are represented in the documents and with the descendants of the individuals who are mentioned in the documents. But as I'm sure is the case in South Africa, as everywhere in the world, libraries and museums don't have large budgets for this sort of work. And so <clears throat> the materials have been sitting there for decades with everybody fully aware of their importance, but unable to fund the sorts of consultation and community work that was necessary to make it appropriate to release them. So a, an historian, Helen Gardner, um, and some anthropologists, some linguists, including myself, some representatives from various Aboriginal organizations in Victoria um, got together and realized that we could probably find some funding for this from particular national grant schemes. And so that's what we did. We put in an application for funding that was to be administered mainly through the uh, museum archive and Aboriginal organizations. So not, although it was a research grant, it was not primarily to be administered through the universities, but for us as university based researchers to work together with these organizations to try to find ways to support communities in doing what they wanted to do with the documents. So that was the basic background to the project. And one of the, one of the projects we were quite inspired by that some of you might have heard of is the Transcribe Bentham project, which was a crowdsourced project where people, trans volunteers from all over the world transcribed um, handwritten materials. And we thought, well, this could also be a way forward for this project because, well, for many reasons. One of them was that we wanted to inspire people to be involved in the project and to care about the project and to realize the significance of what was there. And for that reason, if you can get people actually working on it themselves, they start to take some ownership of it. But we also wanted to spread, I guess, the expertise and the, the authority of the project out beyond the traditional authority holders in a research project. We didn't want it to be a project that was done by university researchers. And so we set up a website at From the Page, which some of you might be familiar with, and I'll show you it live. Um, and that, that's actually, again, a bit of an older stat. So we've got more transcribed now. So hopefully you can see this site. This is the From the Page project site for Howard and Fison. And um, you can go in, anybody can go into any of the documents on here. You can take a look at them. If you want to, you can actually just start transcribing. Obviously, if you sign up, you get some more um, features and you can transcribe more, but you can do a little bit even as a guest. And then you get to have fun with the old fashioned handwriting. So you could just start typing in your transcription here and all of that is then saved to a public space where anyone can see the transcriptions, but also during the funded period of the project, uh, we had employees who were paid to look over the transcriptions and help correct them, index them, um, and do consultation work where needed about anything that turned up in them. So unfortunately, with the end of the project, that level of oversight no longer exists, but it's still possible to continue to transcribe. Um, some of these have been transcribed and I'll show you what that looks like. 
<laughs> not very much here. So someone just started doing a little bit of transcription here and gave up probably because of the handwriting. Um, one of the nice things about this site is it automatically generates various data visualizations once you start linking um, keywords. So for instance, every time there's a person's name, we've asked people to encode it as a name. And behind the scenes, the TEI tra um, transcription encoding initiative is what's being used to save these sorts of links and annotations. But for an average user who's using it, they don't need to know that. They just need to know, put square brackets around things and then they get a pop-up to link it to the, the concept of a name or a place or a language term or a social category. And so <clears throat> once because, because people are doing that, if you're interested, you can go in and then look at all the places a person turns up. So pages that refer to them, it's not a very good example because there aren't very many. And it creates links of um, associations between the different categories. So big headed Jeremy, Jimmy, sorry, turns up associated with the place Port Stevens. And if we click on Port Stevens, we see all these other concepts that are associated with Port Stevens, like the language Gamilaroi. If we click on Gamilaroi, we see other things that are associated with Gamilaroi. So, um, mm, Queensland, and you can just kind of explore the documents by jumping around through this conceptual network and then jumping into the pages of the documents that um, turn up in the network. So it's a really nice kind of automatic feature that you get for free when you start playing with, with this kind of transcription. So we really liked that about this. Um, I guess the other thing that we found with doing this this way is that all kinds of people ended up becoming associated with the project who actually had a lot of expertise and we would probably not have come across otherwise. So people from local historical societies, uh, people whose ancestors were friends with Howart and Fison, um, people whose ancestors were informants of Howard and Fison's, people who just know that somewhere in their family history, one of these, one of these small place names was part of um, the place their family came from. And they might still happen to know a lot about, um, say, the landscape in that place or the plants, plant life in that space because their grandparents told them things. And all this kind of knowledge came out as people started getting associated with the project. And for us, that was so much more valuable than just the time that saved by having people transcribe things for us. We could have paid a research, a research assistant to transcribe, or we could have outsourced this to, you know, to people working in India who transcribe for five cents a page. But we would never ever have made those connections with people who have that, that level of expertise from the community. So for us, that was the main advantage of the crowdsourcing model. And I think when you look at <clears throat> when you look at what people have said in the digital humanities literature about crowdsourcing approaches to research, you see that over and over that they say it doesn't save you money, it doesn't save you time, but it enriches the project because of the wider field of expertise that you can tap into. And enthusiasm too. We have a lot of people now who care a lot about the project and who will continue to work on or, or contribute to topics relevant to the project even beyond its funded life. So <clears throat> that was from the page. Um, as I said before, we, we really wanted to make sure that the, the authority and the expertise in this project was not seen as something that only belonged to university researchers. And so we also made sure we held a number of workshops, ses feedback sessions, and also went out into the communities of people who had some sort of connection to these historical documents and <clears throat> tried to talk to people about it, um, identify people who were interested in being involved with the project further 
And we actually made sure we had a number of paid positions on the project for people from communities that were relevant. So the Ganai Kurnai community, which, <coughs> excuse me, which was one of the main focuses of Howard and Fison's research. The Ganai Kurnai community um, now is in remote Victoria and they have a number of people who have a hugely in-depth knowledge of their own traditions, but um, don't necessarily have a connection to the language anymore. And so, I mean, they have a personal connection in that they care about the language, but they don't, they don't speak it. They, they maybe know some words that have been passed on by their grandparents. Um, it's not a language that's fluently spoken. It's a language that people would really love to revive. But at this point, there's not enough work being done on it from a linguistics perspective to even have a basis for doing that. And so working with community there, um, I guess we benefited from what they could bring to the project in terms of their cultural understanding, but they benefited from being involved in the project, not only through the paid positions, but also because potentially the linguistic information in these documents is enough to start doing, start building up dictionaries and grammars that then might make it possible one day to revive the language. So Russell um, in the top right here is one of the elders of the community and he's very interested in starting some sort of language program for children in the community and he, he spent a lot of time looking through the documents identifying words and um, sentences trying to analyze them <clears throat> and creating small amounts of materials that can already be used with children, like pictures of animals and plants with their names. Um, and he wants to make some videos too, which I think will be fantastic. So that kind of um, interest came from the community and we really wanted to make sure that there was space in the project for community goals rather than just academic goals. So we had a number of these workshops. Um, the final one at the end of the project, which is where this photo is from, was an amazing experience because we brought together people from the Victorian region, which I showed initially, but also people from the other side of Australia who, whose language and culture had been featured in the document because how, in the documents because Howard and Fison had had such a lot of correspondence with people there. And <clears throat> The people in um, Western Australia who were who came to this uh, workshop, particularly the dairy people, um, sorry, the South Australian dairy people, they already have had made so much progress in reviving the language that they, for instance, some of the elders who are present in this photo no longer speak English to anyone. They choose not to. They they conduct all their business in dairy, which is incredible to have gone from a state where nobody spoke the language fluently anymore to the point where people can live their lives only speaking it is an amazing achievement. And the Gano Kono people who were present at this workshop had the opportunity to spend a lot of time with the elders from the Jerry community and learn more about the process that they'd gone through to bring their language to that point. So for me, that, that was actually a really great outcome of this project, that it was able to bring together people from different communities who had similar goals and could connect over this material, but also beyond the materials. And that workshop was a two day workshop where I don't think any linguists, any academic research linguists associated with universities did any of the talking, which for me was also fantastic. We, <coughs> We'd been working with all of these people for several years at this point, and they knew the material better than we do because of their original um, knowledge of the culture and language behind the materials. And so we were able to just sit back and let them run a two day workshop where they talked about the issues from the materials that were interesting and relevant to them, even though not a single person from these communities is an academic researcher associated with the university. And I would say that maybe because of that, um, the level of, the deep level of knowledge that was discussed at that workshop was beyond anything I've ever seen in an academic workshop. 
So for me, that was that was proof the project really succeeded in some way. Um, I actually talked about that already. So I, I want to move on now to something a little bit more technical. And that was one of the, I've got two kind of mini projects associated with this project that I want to lead you through, both of which are kind of digital, digital humanities aspects to them, but <coughs> this one's particularly linguistic and I thought that would interest people from Sadlar. So one of the challenges with these materials is that there was no standardized spelling system for any of the languages that feature in the materials at all. Um, <coughs> Howard and Fison wrote down words as they heard them, and they both had quite a good ear for languages, so it could have been a lot worse. They're at least relatively consistent in the way they spell things, but their correspondence, the people who wrote to them, spelt things their own ways as well. Some of them were not so consistent. And also over time, Howard and Feisten's ideas about what they were hearing changed. And so early on, they may not have heard a particular sound, but later they could hear it and they started writing it. So there's lots and lots of complexities and I guess contradictions in the spelling of Aboriginal words in the data. Um, <clears throat> and from a community perspective, something we always hear when we work with Aboriginal communities is that they don't want to have a spelling system imposed on them by white people, which you know is fair enough, I wouldn't either. And they want to develop their own spelling systems, but that's that's something that takes time and they haven't always got to that point yet. The Gunai Kurnai community has not yet developed an, a standardized orthography that they want to use, but they also don't want us to come in um, as academics who don't have that community background and say, we want you to spell things like this. So we needed to find a solution where the materials could be searchable by somebody who did have some sort of consistent modern orthography in mind and would find all of the different spellings that occur for words. But we definitely didn't want to have a system where we first of all went through the materials and encoded them all in a standardized spelling. That was something that was unacceptable to the, our collaborators, even if that was hidden from the public. So <clears throat> they didn't even want, for instance, a hidden layer where each word was transformed into a modern standard orthography, but that nobody could ever see. Um, they just didn't want that step to happen at all. And so that was, that was a really interesting challenge for us. And we started off thinking about doing the search in kind of a standard way using a sound X. So this is an example of a little interface that was built by <coughs> a postdoc on the project, Michael Falk. Um, and I meant to put his Twitter, by, his Twitter handle on here, but you can find him, I think, just by searching Michael Falk on Twitter. He's now at University of Kent. Um, and <coughs> you can see here that searching for Gunai, G-U-N-N-A-I, returns Kunai, which is what it should do. So these are two potential spellings of the community name and the language name. And the community actually goes by Gunai Kunai now as a combination of the two. Um, but both of these spellings turn up in the text. And so we wanted to be able to search for one and find the other. And this does work. So this basically does do kind of what the community didn't want in that the first step is that every word is encoded um, in a more standardized way. So for instance, G and K and C and CK are all encoded as capital K and A and AH and AR are all encoded as VAL2 and so on. And so this was our initial thought to do this because this is what a lot of linguists do for then comparing similarity between two strings. Um, and it's slightly less problematic than encoding something in an orthography that looks more like something you would read because when you encode a string like this, you end up with lots of numbers and it doesn't really look like we've tried to impose a spelling system. It looks more like a way of coding something. So some community members were fine with this and others didn't like it. 
it does work pretty well though. So we, we, we decided to try and see if we could come up with a solution that didn't rely on this. And because it was 2019-ish, um, everyone wanted to do machine learning and I wanted to do machine learning because it sounded really sexy. So we thought we'd play around <clears throat> with a machine learning approach to learning, to teaching a computer basically what words are the same and what words are different. And so what we did to start with is we came up with a training set, which was pairs of words that we as humans had gone through and said, yes, these are actually two spellings of the same word. So gunai and kunai, or manaru versus monaro, um, gyamban versus tamban, and so on. And so we had to have, <coughs> we had to have a human do that. And then we get the machine, the computer, to figure out its own way of encoding the words. Um, and I, I'm kind of simplifying here a little bit. And I have to say this was work done mostly by Michael and I understand it, but only just. And if you ask me any difficult questions about it, I might cry, so please don't. Um, you, can, uh, you can write to Michael and ask him all your difficult questions. But basically, um, the computer encodes these words using a sort of neural network. And there's no linguist who's saying you need to encode a G as a K. Instead, the computer is saying, I'm going to wire this neuron to this neuron, or I'm going to weight this with 0.53. It's a very different kind of process. Um, and then the computer tests whether this was actually successful, whether this encoding produces the right results. And if it doesn't, um, it tries again until it basically, get, and again, this is really simplified, but until it basically ends up with an encoding that lets it distinguish between words that are different and match up words that are the same. And once it's got that, then you can apply it to new data that it was never trained on and hopefully gets a very high percentage success. Um, so we did this and <coughs> it actually works really well. We managed to get it to something like an 80, 88, 89% success rate in terms of identifying stuff as the same that we think should be the same and stuff as different that we think should be different. Um, and that's on new data. So we, we were pretty satisfied with it. Unfortunately, uh, and this is a um, representation of the actual uh, architecture of the neural net and I'm not going to talk about it but I wanted to put it on here because the link to the slides is available and any of you who actually know anything about um, machine learning and neural networks can have a look at this in your own time and maybe it makes sense and if it doesn't you can ask Michael but yeah so we, we, we decided in the end that there were still some quite big disadvantages to the machine learning approach, even though it was able to successfully differentiate and match words. The main disadvantage is that everyone refused to actually implement it. So um, we were hoping for a search box that could be used on the museum website about the project. So when, they, when people want to search our documents on our final project website, they can search Gunai and get a result that says Kunai and so on. But once you say to you know, the IT people at a museum, we've got a neural net that we need you to implement. Um, they say, yeah, come back to us with another couple of hundred million dollars, please. And that's the end of the project really. <coughs> um, because even though we, we had people with the expertise to set it up, and could probably even have, you know, got it hooked up to the museum website if we'd been given access, which they, they wouldn't. Um, long term, and that's going beyond a couple of months even, things need fixing, um, updating, reinstalling, and the process with, you know, any sort of government funded research project is there's an end to the money. So at some point, and that point is already now, we no longer can say to, to people, actually get Michael in to fix this, make an update, whatever. He's, he's now got another job, we can't pay him. So really, <clears throat> the only approach that can be used for search at this time 
in a big organization like a museum or an archive that's not a research institute and doesn't have computer scientists on board is something that's really simple and that can be handled by somebody who maybe has an undergraduate degree in technology, um, which means probably not machine learning at this point. So the SoundX approach <coughs> is really um, much more achievable from that perspective. We probably end up going with some sort of combination of the two one day if we ever set up our own site that's not hosted by the museum. Um, also the machine learning approach can help us maybe identify better ways to do the SoundX approach. And then ultimately it comes down to community approvals. So that was a bit of a messy end to that mini project, but really interesting from a linguistic and digital humanities perspective. And then the final, um, oops, the final mini project that I wanted to tell you about, I don't have slides, so I'm going to show you more directly. And that's playing around with connecting up APIs, so application programming interfaces, for those of you who aren't aware. An API is just a way of interfacing with a set of data via the via your browser or via um, anything that can, can connect to the internet and get data from a URL. So <coughs> we had in the project, this is the final project website, we have all these letters and so on and a human can click through and look at them. And that's lovely. But if a machine wants to get hold of them, we have a much more efficient way to do that via the API. So let me just grab an API um, endpoint. So this one, for instance, this will give a machine that calls this a list of places. <laughs> no, it won't. I should never do this live. Let's try pages a list of pages in the materials. And so it, it gives this in a format that the computer can handle, <coughs> but you'd never want a human to actually read. So number of pages, starting index, items per page, um, results as the actual encoded text and so on. And you can do all kinds of really cool things if you can automatically pull this kind of information into a script. And so I'll just show you a couple of, of Cool things that we started playing with by doing this and it, they mostly rely on the fact that all kinds of other software and archives also have APIs so we can connect information from this project to information in libraries and archives elsewhere we can connect it to things like google maps and do all kinds of fun things and we've been using um, basically Jupyter notebooks which some of you might have heard of but it's it's a really nice kind of environment <coughs> for doing Python programming in a browser-like environment where you can add lots of text notes and explanations. You can add, um, you can make it collaborative with other people and so on. And in Australia, Digital Humanities has been really pushing people towards using Jupyter. Now I kind of cheated here a bit and I'm using the Google implementation of Jupyter Notebooks, which is called Colab. Um, I'll just show you quickly. No, that goes to a drive. Never mind. Um, Colab is a thing. Um, so you can add blocks of code and you can add blocks of text in. And because it's a Google product, you can also do things like add notes and comments to somebody else. You can share it just like any other Google thing, like a Google document and so on. And so you can see I've added some notes in here. And this is something that's a lot harder to do in most other programming environments. So we use it a lot for teaching as well. So I'll just walk you through what I've done here. Um, but again, I'm happy to send links to people if they're interested in looking at it in more detail. <coughs> so with this, what I wanted to do is map all the place names that turn up in the documents. So first of all, I tell it about some libraries that I want it to use. I get the data from um, the list of places from 
to Howard and Fison materials. <coughs> That's via the API that I just talked about. Then I get the full text of the documents from the Howard and Fison materials. I do some stuff to pull the text, the actual text, the content out of that um, result that the API returns. Then I clean it, I take out some of the special characters. I create a map. <coughs> I take all of the place names, um, geocode them. So I use another API to find the coordinates of these place names. And that's a little bit tricky because some of these place names have different spellings from their modern spellings. Some of them don't even exist in modern um, maps. But at the moment, I just kind of skip all the, all the ones that don't work. And so we get some coordinates. And then I tell it to put them on a map. And so this map shows all the place names that are mentioned in any of the documents. Then you can also actually search the materials, because remember, I also pulled out the full text. You can search them for those place names, get a sentence or two associated with the place names. You can actually see what they were saying about them. And then we can look at Trove, which is the National Library of Australia, and use their API, because they also have a really good API. So we request from the National Library via the URL, a photo or a picture relating to each place name. So this is what I've done here. So I stopped it running at this point, but you can see for each place name in the documents, I then grab a picture. And what I could do if I wanted to make this even more interesting is grab a picture from that same year. The documents all have years associated with them. I could say I want a picture of Warangatta from 1819, or sorry, 1890, um, rather than just a random one. And at the moment, all this is just happening in this notebook for me to look at, but it would be very easy to output this to a nice website that people could browse or search. So that was one little experiment. And we did a number like that. Um, we did one where we looked at all the color words in the data, and then you can visualize, you know, which, which years or which seasons um, they used which colors when they described things. <coughs> we also started doing one, which I don't have up here right now, where we looked at historical newspapers. So we found places um, and people's names in the document, and then we got from another API um, results of newspaper articles from those times the same dates with those people and places. So then you can contextualize what's happening in the Howard and Fison materials by looking at what was in the newspapers about those places and people at that time. So I'm gonna wind up there, um, leaving some time for questions, but I hope that <coughs> kind of illustrated, I guess, a few different ways where a digital approach to, a, to what's really a very non-digital set of data, right? It's, it's handwritten archival documents, but where digital approaches can kind of contextualize and broaden. And also I think um, digital humanity, the, the sort of collaborative and this hierarchical side of digital humanities inspired this project to take a slightly different approach to working with communities than some other projects do. And I think it was, it benefited from that a lot. So thanks very much. Oh, wonderful. Thank you very much. I, I personally really enjoyed it. Um, <laughs> seeing, seeing that link between, you know, documents that you start with up to the point where I feel relatively comfortable on the on the digital side. <laughs> um, I, I hope that there, I mean, I've got a list of questions uh, and I think we can talk about this for for hours. Um, but but I would first like to see if there are any questions from the uh, the audience. So if you have any questions, please just type them in the chat so we can we can see them. Nobody dares to. Uh, okay. Otherwise, I'll just start and people can still uh, still write down the questions. Um, so I, I was actually really interested. So I, I I understand the amount of work that goes in it, and I understand the. Uh, the computational aspect. I was actually personally really curious about the the, in, the really the, the initial start. So how do you even figure out that there is such a collection of letters? And uh, kind of related, how do you figure out 
where you can find that th th these letters because you you mentioned they're in different libraries they're even in different countries how do you how do you find how how, how do you start Oh, okay, let me see. That's interesting. Thank you. Um, I got oh. an error message that said the host <laughs> is not allowing people to unmute themselves. Oh, wait a minute. Let me see um, what I can do there. Well, it's all right. I just won't mute myself again, maybe. But um, <laughs> yeah, no, that's a really good question. And I think <coughs> it really shows that a project like this isn't a three year project, even though that's what it says on paper, because probably for 10 to 15 years before that, various people involved in this project had been working on topics relevant to it. So the, the main historian on the project, Helen Gardner, had been writing a book about Howard um, and Tulaba and about their collaboration. And so she was already working with these kinds of materials, although to some extent she wasn't because what she was doing was finding through, you know, the usual means that historians find out about things, finding that these materials existed and then being told she couldn't access them because communities hadn't given permission. And so she started to say, well, why not? You know, can I go and talk to community members and get permission? And the museum said, well, you can try. Um, we can't really help you with that though. And so she started talking to people and she then found too that many members of the community like Russell, uh, Russell Mullet, who I mentioned earlier, knew that these materials were there and they themselves wanted to access them and wanted to, people to know about them. But um, in many cases, Aboriginal people don't feel welcome in colonial institutions like museums and archives. The, Australia has, as many, country, many colonial countries do, has a horrible history of treating Aboriginal people like non-humans. And for many years, they were not permitted in you know, universities or archives or public buildings um, and even today when they are the amount of racism they face is horrifying and so people don't feel comfortable going into the big city walking up to a museum desk and saying I want to look at my grandfather's materials you hold they they worry that they'd be laughed out of the building and possibly it might happen and so I think that was the point where the project really was born where Helen was talking to people and they realized they had a mutual goal. They wanted these materials to be kind of liberated from the museum, liberated from these, these colonial archives. Okay, wonderful. I think that's, yeah, I, I, I get a better understanding of the project <laughs> now. <laughs> Thanks. So uh, Lydia also has a question. How can we make use of the handwriting typography in the future research? Can, can Lydia maybe expand on that question, what, what she means by the handwriting typography? Sorry, I meant transcription. All oh, right. Um, so I'm hoping that people will build on the transcribed corpus. Um, both to continue to transcribe it, but also to use it for other projects. And in fact, there's a really nice South African connection here. So I have a colleague who has a part-time appointment at the University of Johannesburg and part-time at Western Sydney University. And he wants to, he's doing a project now, or he's starting a project about um, traditional and colonial perspectives on weather, on rain particularly. Um, and so he's working with South African academics who are thinking about um, traditional knowledge about, about rain, rainmaking practices, um, rituals and songs and stories about rain. And his role in the project is to have the same sort of approach in Australia and think about what are traditional Aboriginal perspectives on this and also how did they intersect with colonial understandings of the, of the landscape and the climate. And so he wants to use this material to look through it and see what, what was said about rain, what was said about climate and landscape and by who, and can you find out from these documents what the European colonial perspective was and untangle that from um, the perspective of the collaborators that we're working with. 
So that's that's one example of a project that might build on this somewhat and have that nice South African connection, which I really like. Um, so that's one one thing. I think even just the process of <coughs> having um, seen how you can get community members to to start transcribing handwriting um, is valuable. And then finally, we also now, because we have, I think about 30% of the documents transcribed, we have a large enough corpus that we can start to try and test things um, like tran transcribus, which is an automatic handwriting identification software. So it can then basically use machine learning again to learn to transcribe handwriting into printed text itself. And it, it didn't work very well at the beginning of the project because we didn't have enough training data, but at this point we do. So we want to try that next too. Okay, cool. Um, uh, so I think we have time for one more <coughs> question. Uh, so Gideon writes, obviously you're building a very interesting knowledge base for researchers in the humanities. Do you link your results to any of the Wikimedia projects? So Wikipedia, Wikidata, et cetera. At this point in one direction only. So some of these um, little scripts I've been playing around with to analyze and visualize some of the data um, does connect to things in Wikipedia because Wikipedia has an API as well. So we can do things like pull in a bio of a person from Wikipedia into a notebook. Um, looking at the people in the, in the documents and so on. We're not at this point doing anything in terms of getting our data and our results into the Wikimedia kind of projects. Um, and I'd like to, it's not something I have expertise in and my own experiments with, um, I guess, editing Wikipedia in particular show that it is something you need to build up a bit of credibility and expertise in before you can produce things that actually end up being kept. And then there's the issues around, you know, not um, producing Wikipedia pages on your own research and so on. So there, there are some issues there, but it is something I'm, I'm interested in doing in the future. Okay, wonderful. So perhaps there is time for one more question. We have two minutes left. <laughs> Otherwise we'll, we'll leave it at this. I would, yeah, I, I'd really like to, to thank you uh, Rachel, for this really interesting uh, presentation, um, I, yeah, like like I said, I think we should we should um, um, meet up again someday. Also, when we're allowed to travel again, so we can actually just sit down with a cup of coffee and uh, and and discuss things. Um, I found it really interesting, and uh, looking at the chat, I'm not the only one. So thank you very much for for the presentation. Um, thank and you. Then I'd like to, yeah, thank you, and I'd like to close the uh, the session here now. Thanks. Thanks. Bye-bye. Take care. Yep, you too.